Today I'm going to talk to you a bit about JavaScript fatigue and why we can learn with it. Up there is my GitHub and Twitter profile in case you want to follow me there. Feel free to do so, send me questions or anything. And well, I'm a core maintainer of both Chai.js and Sino.js. And during this time I've been involved with the open source community, I thought a lot about all the tools we have to deal with. And well, JavaScript fatigue has been a recurring theme uh, in the JavaScript community. So that's why I thought uh, I should put together a talk and tell people why I think this is good and why we should see it with good eyes. And I'd like to start this talk with something that people don't usually learn in college. And please don't get me wrong, I think college is very important, I think college is great, but I think it lacks a very important subject which is called Realities of Your Industry 101. <laughs> and <laughs> since I'm going to make pretty bold statements here, I'm going to wear a wizard hat so that I can get a bit more credibility in what I'm talking. <laughs> <And> <laughs> And well, the first truth here is that software solves business problems. And most software out there is what we would call boring software, where they don't have like high scalability constraints, they don't have to, be, to have good performance or something like that. That's things we should worry about when they're necessary. Most software out there just, is just trying to solve problems. And that's because we're not paid to write code, I'm sorry for that, but we're actually paid to, so we're not paid to write code, we're paid to solve problems. And we should keep in mind that technology is not a goal. You know, using hipster frameworks and languages is not a goal. Using complex data structures is not a goal. Technology is not a goal. And I'm going to be even bolder and say that writing beautiful code is not a goal and writing bug-free software is not a goal. That's because cost versus revenue is the only thing that matters. You know, we don't write beautiful code just because we like beautiful code. We write it because it makes us more effective in the long term, in the long run. And therefore, we increase revenue and we decrease costs. And the same happens to bugs. We don't like bug. We don't write. Uh, don't just avoid writing bugs because we don't like bugs. We avoid writing bugs because our clients don't like bugs. And if you've ever found out that uh, a bug ended up, ended up becoming a feature, well, would you solve it? Not because it's giving you revenue, right? And all this crazy stuff, you know, launching rockets into space, self-driving cars artificial intelligent robots, it's not happening just because someone thinks, it, thinks it's cool. It's happening because it's viable, because it's economically viable. And maybe I should not even call this section realities of your industry 101. Maybe I should call it realities of capitalism 101. And well, uh, maybe since cost versus revenue is what really matters, maybe we should start paying more attention to other aspects of software development such as the importance of having good design and clear requirements. And while in seven, 1975, Bowen actually did this study where he found out that the software he was looking at, actually 64% of the errors he found were uh, caused by design and not by code. And maybe we should start paying more attention to design. In the Apollo project, for example, 73% of all errors were design errors. And without good design, without clear requirements, it's hard for good to code to exist, and it's hard for code to exist at all, and this is why you should pay attention to it. Without requirements or design, you know, writing code is just like adding bugs to an empty text file, you know? Because when we write code, we're trying to solve problems. That's why we're doing it. We're just not writing code because we like it. And while these things of them, you know, Babel, Mocha, Chai, everything here, it exists to solve problems. And we must know why we're using these tools. We must comprehend this, these goals, because otherwise we will end up with JS fatigue. Because JS fatigue is what happens when people use tools they don't need to solve problems they don't have. Donald Nuff once said that premature optimization is the root of all evil. And while I totally agree with him, because if you don't have a problem to solve, why would you add unnecessary complexity to your software? Why would you increase your costs if you're not increasing your revenue? If you remember the driven development, well, I think you should apply it to everything. And I'm not just telling, that, telling you that you should write tests for everything. I'm telling you that you should wait for problems to appear before actually trying to solve them. That's the TDD approach. And Kent Beck himself, he says that TDD is a fear reduction technique. So when you do TDD, you reduce your fear. And if you do like, if you apply TDD techniques, to your JavaScript projects, maybe you also reduce your fear. And you also reduce analysis paralysis, which is a funny name, by the way, uh, which is what happens when you open up Netflix 
and you end up spending three hours deciding what you're going to watch. <laughs> and that's because you have so many options, you end up getting overwhelmed by them. And by reducing the number of choices we gotta make, you know, making one choice at a time, we reduce the scope of those decisions and we have less options. And therefore, we reduce analysis paralysis. But now let's talk a bit about our environment, about JavaScript. Well, and I think there's no better way of showing people how real JavaScript fatigue is than by showing them a bunch of impressive numbers. So at the time I was writing these slides, we had almost 500,000 packages on NPM, which is an average of 479 packages a day. And that's 6.5 times the amount of people uh, born daily in Nebraska. <laughs> in the last five years, the NPM registry has grown like a thousand times, and since 2012 has grown 100,000%. So this is huge, the NPM ecosystem is huge, JavaScript itself is huge. I think my head still looks good. But how did that end up happening? Well, each two has its reason to exist. Our transpilers, Babel, you know, Callstreet, all those things, they, have, they exist because of a reason. So we use Babel not because we like writing next generation code, but because we need to solve a problem, which is to make our next generation code compatible with older browsers and compatible with lots of environments. So JSX, you know, that abstraction, we need Babel to write it. And module bundlers, that's quite a long story, which uh, our friend Corey uh, has told us about this morning. So basically, it was very difficult and tedious to just be throwing out uh, random, random script tags in our HTML. It was hard to handle that. So in 2009, uh, RequireJS uh, came out. And then we had like uh, AMD, but that was quite verbose and it added like lots of uh, injection uh, to our code. And therefore, and then Node.js came out with synchronous required statements, which are simple, and that became the new uh, industry standard. So we needed a way to bring that to our browser. So again, we were not just doing things because they were cool, we were doing them because we need to solve problems. And this is the problems these two solve. So we need Webpack, we need Browserify to do that and bring that to our browsers. And front-end frameworks, they just provide us good abstractions for us to think about problems and focus on what matters. So these things, they help us forget about implementation details uh, such as like uh, having to worry about manipulating the DOM and having to worry with the logic uh, of our application at the same time. And this is basically what we've been doing in computer science this whole time. You know, we're abstracting stuff so that we can get more high level and be more productive. And abstractions, they're necessary because they reduce the cognitive load of how things work and then you can focus on creating so they make us more productive. And all those things, they have something in common. And the thing they have in common is that they happen because the web platform moves too fast. You know, if we had to like create standards for all those things, it would take a lot of time. You know, standards are great, but by having frameworks, we were able to move faster. You know, imagine if we didn't have Babel or React or all those stuff. And maybe they can even become native someday. And more tools mean more choices. So we have more problems. We need more tools to solve these problems. And then we end up having more choices. So this is not something necessarily bad. I've seen a guy with a, a Unix t-shirt out there. Is he here? Yeah, great. You rock, man. Uh, so if you think about the Unix philosophy, this is good if you have modules that do one thing and that do it well and that you can combine so that you can build bigger, pro bigger uh, programs with uh, smaller blocks. In the testing ecosystem, for example, if you have Chai.js and Mocha, well, Chai only does assertions and Mocha only runs tests. And those are very uh, separate responsibilities. And if you want to change one of those, you can just do it and your things will continue working. And also, if you want to add another piece to this stack of software, such as Karma, to run tests uh, in multiple browsers, multiple environments, you can do that because the Unix philosophy says that you should write programs that work together. And this also uh, creates natural selection in our ecosystem. So the frameworks that people use, they thrive, you know, they go forward, they have more contributors, they end up bringing more people together, which is why Red got so popular. It has so many people around it so many plugins, all that stuff. So with natural selection, 
we're able to move faster than standards because people decide what's good and what's not. And sometimes even those tools can become native. And it's also important to realize that our tools are not new. You know, we're always trying to get like inspiration into other languages, into what's happening into other environments. So NPM, you know, RubyGems, Maven Central, that stuff, it's all centered around the same concept, you know, being a package manager. You know, JSX, well, that existed like 13 years before with E4X. Babel and GCC, they, sh they share the same basic compiler principles. You know, in order to transpile your code, Babel has to do a lot of compiler magic. And Goop, Grunt, NPM, Webpack, we, that already existed before and we call it new make. And well, it worked well and it still works well. And actually there's a reasonable amount of projects in JavaScript that still use it. We still use new make in Shy, not because we want to be hipsters, you know, we want to use like vintage tools, but, <laughs> but because that solves our problem because that's simple. And that's why I use new make. But I'm not saying the other tools are not good. I'm just saying that you should pick your battles carefully. You should pick the technology that solves your problems. And you know, using web technology into mobile, well, that already exists with Symbian. Basically, we are always finding inspirations in other areas of tech. But how should we deal with all these uh, new knowledge, you know, all these new tools? Uh, basically, the first thing to realize is that you don't need to know everything. And especially because that's something possible to do. So you might get frustrated. And if you're going to start learning something, start from the beginning, you know. Learn JS well, learn HTML5 well, learn CSS well, uh, web fundamentals, computer science fundamentals, all that kind of stuff. Because that will allow you to understand how your framework works behind the scenes if you ever need to. But, you know, don't get too attached to that because sometimes you know, this can be just like trying to learn how to swim by seeing how other people swim and studying the dynamic of fluids. That not, that's not how it happens. Sometimes you just gotta jump into the pool and start trying to swim all by yourself. In learning, I think you should avoid boilerplates because they add too much necessary complexity in the beginning. So when you're just trying to learn a technology, you know, try to see where each piece fits. You know, as I said, you gotta understand why you're adopting each tool. You cannot just use lots of tools because you think they're cool. Of course, boilerplates are necessary and they're good when you already know what you're doing, when you, can, when you know your requirements, when you know what your problems are gonna be because you'll be using that thing to solve your problems. But when you're just learning, you know, try to build something from scratch, try to create your own webpack configuration, that kind of stuff. And don't be too attached to a single technology. You know, as we've seen, all the things that we have in JavaScript, they already existed before. The concepts already existed before. So don't be afraid to explore new languages and new ecosystems and new environments because that's good for you. you know, and don't even be afraid to explore subjects like philosophy or psychology or any of that stuff because that might give you good ideas, you know, good abstractions, good things to think about and apply in, your world, in the real world. And even if you don't, that's knowledge too and that's valid. So, this is a very important uh, advice I was given when I was a student intern. So my supervisor, Andrea, he realized I was sometimes very overwhelmed by the amount of information, by the amount of tools we gotta use to solve our problems. And in my last internship day, he said to me that whenever you want to learn something, like for you, whenever you want to really feel like you dominate something, you should dig deep. And I think there's no better quote to illustrate this than this one by Richard Feynman in which he says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And just below this phrase in the same blackboard, he wrote a phrase which is, know how to solve every problem that has been solved. And while these problems, they have already been solved, we just gotta understand how people do it. You know, you, 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 don't, you just need to understand things. The things have already been discovered, it's written there. If you read it and you don't understand, you know, you can just read it again because the knowledge is there. People have already figured that stuff out. And that's why I like so much talks such as the ones in which Dan Bramal, for example, explain how to implement uh, Redux from scratch or blog posts that teach you how to implement a JSX renderer from scratch. That's why I think they're so great. But, so you should pick your battles carefully. You don't, don't need to dig deep in everything. 
you can learn stuff on demand, you know. You can like learn stuff when it's needed to solve a problem. You don't need to learn it all at once. And also, you don't need to get all the implementation details right. You don't have to have like web performing code when you're doing this because you just gotta learn the mental process of getting to the solution and how it works. Another thing that I've been talking during this whole talk is that you should not get ahead of yourself. So since we love doing comparisons of our roles as developers to engineering, civil engineering, I have a pretty cool one here by Sam Newman. And he basically says that we should not just act as software engineers, we should act as town planners. This right here is the city of Barcelona, and when you look at it this way, it just looks like a common city. But when you look at it from the sky, you see it's very organized, it works really well, it has very well-defined areas. So basically, the people that were building Barcelona at the time could not predict how it was going to look like in two or three hundred years. So they had to make it grow organically. And that's what we should do with our software. We should be town planners. You know, we should let you go organically in an organized way. We should solve problems as they come by. And it's even easier for us because software is flexible, but engineering is not. Our build time is compile time. We can just destroy things all the time. We can always change things. We can spend more time designing and thinking than building. And you can build things as many times as you want. So people in Barcelona, they could not just like destroy buildings to give space to new ones. But in software, you can do that with, uh, in, a lot, uh, in a way that's a lot easier. So when you're writing software, you know, let it grow, adapt as needed, solve one problem at a time, and you know, be a town planner. And if you want to read more about this, and Newman has an excellent book about, book about microservices in which uh, he talks about that in his introduction, and I think it's just fantastic. And this is also important because since frameworks are abstractions, uh, as uh, Sam Koblenski says, abstractions only work well in the right context. And the right context develops as the system develops. Strive to be lazy. Well, this is another great advice a friend in college has told me once, and I always stick to it. So I was struggling to learn how to do something with him in a few comments, and he said to me that I should always strive to be lazy as a programmer. I should always work to work less, and I should not only work harder, but smarter. And whenever you're feeling you're having too much work doing some stuff, go out and look for a better way to do it. Always be trying to improve, always be striving to be lazy. And that's why it's so important to talk to people. Because sometimes you do not realize that you're like wasting too much time doing something that other people have already figured out a better way to do. So this is why it's so important to come to conferences, you know, and talk to people at your side or whenever, wherever you meet about how they solve their problems, you know, what tools they're using, and what they like, what they don't, and why. And it's also great to read blog posts by companies telling you how they use the technologies they use and why they do that, because they'll not only be teaching you about technology, they'll be teaching you about how they use that to solve real-world problems. And finally, I also think that you should build things, you know, because building things is extremely essential only, the only way of facing problems yourself is by building things. So whenever you're reading tutorials you know, to learn a technology, those are great. I highly encourage you to do so. But after you see tutorials, go and try to build something by yourself. Because in tutorials, people, they create abstractions to show you how abstractions work to teach you, and that's great. But you only see the real value of abstraction when you need it in your day-to-day -day life. But if I had to sum this whole talk up, in a single statement, I'd say that you should solve problems. Because you know, software is not this magical box with just, uh, even though I have this awesome hat, uh, <laughs> that you should do what you want and you'll be happy. You should be always striving to solve problems. You should always be aiming to make the world a better place and to solve somebody's problem. That's why software exists. So if I had a single advice for you today, it would be to go out there and you'll solve problems by yourself, improve the world. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much.